Uh, my name is Gabriel Mayo. I'm the executive director of the Ruskin Art Club. Uh, when I, uh, Ruskin Art Club is Los Angeles's oldest cultural and arts association dating back to 1888, although every time I say that, I do it uh, uh, with a little bit of trepidation that someone's going to come up and tell me that their organization was founded six months earlier. <laughs> we actually had that happen once. Uh, we used to advertise ourselves as the Southland's oldest cultural and arts association until the Shakespeare Club in Pasadena informed me that they were formed five days before we were, so we could no longer truth and advertise. So. Um, uh, the Ruskin Art Club is part of that uh, movement, kind of a wildfire movement, really, of Ruskin uh, reading guilds, Ruskin societies uh, that sprang up at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and were particularly influence, influential here in Southern California. Uh, and throughout the United States as people began to, to be intrigued and inspired by Rus John Ruskin, the art and social critic John Ruskin's ideas about the unity of art and life and the, uh, his, his radical connection between aesthetics, between what we might call aesthetic vision and empathetic vision, to what a moral vision. Uh, so we're part of that uh, impulse. And uh, I must say also that our relations with uh, USC uh, go back a long way uh, to the very beginnings of USC. We, the Ruskin Art Club was involved with the founding of the uh, School of Fine Arts uh, way back when and was uh, very close to, uh, uh, to William Lees Judson, a, uh, a great uh, painter here in, the, uh, in Southern California, particularly connected with the Arroyo Seco uh, School. So we're delighted uh, to be, we feel home at home here. Uh, we've placed uh, the uh, historical archives of the Ruskin Art Club with material going all the way back to 1888 uh, is here at USC at the Special Collections Department. So we, again, we really feel uh, uh, quite at home here. We're delighted uh, to co-sponsor uh, this lecture with the Levan Institute and thank in particular Lynn Boyd Judson uh, for uh, for really being the, the driving force behind uh, organizing uh, this lecture. Uh, John Ruskin has uh, so much to say to us now at, on, in the area of ecology and environmentalism, so we feel it's a very timely uh, topic and a, a very important uh, prophetic source for us to uh, connect with again. Um, let me uh, ask Professor Jim Spates uh, he'll come forward. He's, uh, Jim is uh, a uh, Ruskin scholar and, I must say, a member of the Ruskin Art Club, uh, as well as a companion of the Guild of St. George, uh, and a leader, really, in uh, uh, an effort to uh, bring the Guild of St. George, a charity founded by John Ruskin in 1871, to bring the work of the, uh, the modern work of the Guild uh, here to the United States uh, as well. So I'm going to ask uh, Jim to come forward and to uh, introduce our lecturer today. Thanks very much. So as he said, my name is Jim Spates. I'm a professor of sociology emeritus at Hobart and Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. I've been working on Ruskin for a quarter century and more now. Don't regret a moment though. It was wonderful. I found the sociologist I'd always been looking for when I found out the Ruskin. And met this man, who's going to be your lecturer in just a minute or two. Um, at the time I was doing that, we've been very dear friends ever since. Um, so Ruskin, uh, I want to just give you a very slight background on, on the Guild of St. George, because it's important to get a sense of what Clive's going to talk about in a few minutes. Ruskin began, as you know, as an art and architecture critic. He was the toast of British society. His books were brilliantly argued, brilliantly written, and everybody who was anybody knew Ruskin, um, admired Ruskin, applauded Ruskin everywhere. And by the time he got to uh, about the middle of the, of the 1850s, he decided that his artwork wasn't really having the effect that he wanted it to have. He really wanted to reform the world. He wanted people to appreciate nature. He wanted to, people to understand why art was such an important thing in human life. And he realized they loved his prose, 
and they loved buying Turner paintings because he said they were good paintings to buy, but they didn't really get what Turner was about, and they didn't really get all his arguments. So he, in the late 1850s, he gives up art and architecture criticism and becomes a sociologist. He writes a wonderful, brilliant book of four essays called Unto This Last, goes on to write a number of essays all throughout the 1860s about the social world, what's wrong with it. First, really full frontal attack on laissez-faire capitalism, because Marx was working but had not published in English for another 30 or 40 years. And meets tremendous criticism for this, decides by the end of the 1860s that the sociological criticism isn't getting where he wants it to, to go. And then he decides, well, it's not in the thinking and the writing and the arguing, it's in the doing. And so in 1870, in 1871, he begins a set of uh, letters that are called Fours Clavigero. We can take what I want to talk about what the title means, but we won't. And in the, in the, in the initial essays uh, of Fours Clavigero, which are addressed to the working people of England, he makes a fundamental argument that what we have to do is something with our own lives in order to make the world better. So he begins by founding something called, as Gabriel told you about a moment ago, he begins by founding the St. George's Company. He calls it the St. George's Company because it's a company of like-minded individuals who are trying to reform the world, and it's named after St. George, because St. George is the patron saint of England. And if you know, let me show you some, a picture of this. If you know the story of St. George, the great famous picture of St. George is he's killing the dragon. The dragon of what? The dragon of evil, the dragon of modernity, you know, Ruskin is living in a time the Industrial Revolution is in high gear, pollution is everywhere, poor people by the millions upon millions, British society as he knew it and loved it disappearing, we need to do something about this. So in 1878, he renames the St. George's Company, he renames it the Guild of St. George, he becomes the first master of the Guild of St. George, oversees it, and the Guild of St. George, I'm happy to say, is still alive and well today. Um, it's gone on for now 145 years. Like any organization that's 145 years old, it's had its ups and downs. But I'm here to tell you, it's in enough phase right now. <laughs> <laughs> Clive has been master of the guild for what, five, six years? Six. Six years now. And as Guy mentioned a moment ago, we're trying to get Ruskin's message out across North America for the first time in a serious way. There is a wonderful um, publication coming now, out every year now called The Companion. Anybody who's a member of the Guild of St. George is called The Companion of the Guild. That was Ruskin's word for it. And a lovely magazine right here, which you're welcome to have a look at over here. We have a number of copies. If you'd like them, see me afterwards, and I'll tell you how much they cost. Okay. So it's quite expensive. <laughs> it's quite exp it, they're $10 if you really want them. Because, but they're really, really lovely. It's a, a magnificent magazine. Um, we also have, if you're interested in that, a uh, pamphlet on Ruskin in Sheffield. It's a new project. Ruskin began much of the guild work in Sheffield because it was an industrial, hard-working town and he wanted particularly to get to working class people. He was done with the rich people. They weren't listening. He was done with the literary people. He really wanted to get to working people and get them to see what art was all about, get them to see how they could put their hands on things, make new things, realize their own potential that the industrial machine just overlooked entirely, because he believed everybody had talent. Everybody had something that they could contribute. So it was a great vision that began the Guild of St. George. We have pamphlets. These don't cost anything, if you'd like to see those <laughs> afterwards. Um, and it's just such a great delight to see people way out here on the West Coast. For us, it's new territory. And we're delighted that there's so many people here who are interested in, in, in uh, coming to hear something about Mr. Bruskin. So my dear friend. The master of the Guild of St. George, Ruskin was the first, he's now the one, he's now the master of St. George. Um, the, the title of Clive's talk is Human Nature and Natural Abundance, John Ruskin and the Environment. And so now, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much also to Gabriel and to the Ruskin Art Club for inviting me and to the University of Southern California for hosting this occasion. It's a terrific thing to be here and I'm very conscious of Ruskin's influence has been felt quite deeply in Los Angeles and one sees it in the arts and crafts movement as it developed um, over the decades in this city and is to some extent still alive today. So it's a great honor to be here. Thank you very much. 
Um, Jim's given me a very useful and helpful introduction. I'll just try and briefly just summarize a couple of things about Ruskin before I embark on the lecture, because I'm conscious not everybody here would have read Ruskin, and my purpose is to introduce him. But Ruskin, as you will have gathered, is an immensely complex figure. He begins as an art critic, writing about Turner above all, but writing about art over the centuries too. And he writes about art always while talking about the physical world itself, what he calls nature in the way of the 19th century. Um, art for Ruskin is always referable to nature. You, human effort is meaningless without some awareness and uh, perception of the natural world which informs it. He goes on from writing about art to writing about architecture and thinking about how what we build for ourselves has to relate to what we had already in what is nature. And then, as Jim explained to you, he becomes a social critic, an economic critic. By the end of his life, he's writing about almost everything. He's a, one of the great critics of culture and society. And my purpose today is to talk about Ruskin in relation to the, what we nowadays call the environment, the issues of climate change, uh, pollution, global warming, environmental and ecological issues. Ruskin was one of the great 19th century conservationists, and that's the context in which I want to talk about him. There he is, um, as a, an energetic 40-year-old, around the time when he wrote Unto This Last. And you see the emblem of the Guild of St. George there beside him, well explained by Jim. It's St. George fighting the dragon, fighting the dragon of evil. Um, interestingly, of course, dragons belch out smoke and fire, legendarily. And uh, it's pretty clear that Ruskin associated that with what the great factories of northern England were doing in the Industrial Revolution, breathing out fire and smoke, polluting the landscape, destroying the natural world in the interests of what is called wealth, which he rather disputed. And I'm going to start with an anecdote which will focus what Ruskin was like very well. The poet and classical scholar A. E. Hausman was at Oxford as an undergraduate in the 1870s. And in his first term, he attended lectures that Ruskin was giving at Oxford. Ox Ruskin in the 70s was the Slade Professor of Fine Art in Oxford, the first chair of fine art that there was at an <coughs> English university. It was a new subject for universities in those years. And Hausman, like a lot of uh, energetic young undergraduates, went to Ruskin's lectures to see what this remarkable man was saying. And he writes a letter home to his parents. And he says this, this afternoon, Ruskin gave us a great outburst against modern times. He had got a picture of Turner's, framed and glassed, representing Leicester and the Abbey in the distance at sunset over a river. The picture was from Ruskin, I'm, this is me rather than Hausman now, was from Ruskin's collection of watercolours. I haven't uh, been able to find you an image of it, but uh, it's a picture that Turner painted for publication in a book of picturesque views of England. And this is the print that was made from it at the time. Picturesque views of England is the title, 1839. Uh, Ruskin showed the students this picture and then, according to Hausman, he placed it on an easel, as if he were going to paint. And he said to them, you, if you like, may go to Leicester to see what it's like there now. I never shall, but I can make a pretty good guess. Then he caught up a paintbrush. These stepping stones, of course, have been done away with and are replaced by a beautiful iron bridge. Then he dashed in the iron bridge on the glass of the picture. The colour of the stream is supplied on one side by the indigo factory. Forthwith, one side of the stream became indigo. On the other side, by the soap factory. 
soap dashed in. They mix in the middle, like curds, he said, working them together with a sort of malicious determination. <laughs> this field, over which you see the sun setting behind the abbey, is not occupied in a proper manner. There then went a flame of scarlet across the picture, which developed itself into windows and roofs and red brick and rushed up into a chimney. The atmosphere is supplied thus, a puff and cloud of smoke all over Turner's sky. And then the brush thrown down and Rustin confronting modern civilization amidst a tempest of applause, which he always elicits now, as he has this term become immensely popular. His lectures being crowded, whereas of old he used to prophesy to empty benches. Well, it's an extraordinary story, and it clearly was a bravura performance by Ruskin. You learn a great deal about him from this anecdote. His love of nature, his sense of great art as above all a celebration of nature, his anger at the effects of industrial industrialization, his secular preaching mingled with grim humor, his anger at modern civilization, his desire to shock. The speaker was not an angry and adolescent, but the most famous of living English intellectuals, now aged about 60. You may also glimpse what, for a modern reader, seems something of a paradox. Ruskin called himself a conservative, the inveterate foe of modern innovation. But he was also the doughtiest defender of the natural world against the depredations of the capitalist system, and into the bargain, though it's not strictly relevant to tonight's lecture, a champion of the poor and deprived. <coughs> That's to say, he sounds like a radical, a green perhaps, a socialist perhaps, a rebel against capitalism and the captains of industry. When Hausmann talks of Ruskin prophesying, he puts his finger on the aspect of his anecdote that brings all the elements together. Like several of his contemporaries, Ruskin was influenced by the biblical figure of the prophet, a wise man, one with foresight, who sees into the evil of his times and has the courage to preach against it. Like most modern, sorry, like most prophets, Ruskin saw himself as a conservative, as I've said, small c, understanding the word in its strict sense, one who seeks to conserve whatever we inherit that is of value. Institutions, social relationships, the built environment, the natural world. Today, we might call him not a conservative, but perhaps a conservationist, same word in its origin. Like the distinguished Marxist historian Tony Jutt, who died recently, some of you may know his work, we might want even to argue that insofar as Ruskin can be described as a socialist, socialists are inherently conservative. That's a sort of paradox. And that it is capitalism, unchecked capitalism at any rate, which wants to dispense with the past. The past, whether it's in the form of natural beauties that had developed over the centuries, or human artifacts of historic significance, the past just gets in the way of profit and what some people like to call progress. Unchecked capitalism needs change in order to profit from it. And Ruskin was against needless change. Incidentally, I say that Ruskin was a socialist. He wasn't actually a socialist, but he's often been understood as that, and he certainly inspired socialists. The outstanding young Ruskin scholar here in America, Sarah Atwood, has been saying recently that we shouldn't use the word environmentalist to describe Ruskin. She says, and I think she's probably right, that when we use that word, 
we're thinking about a response to what has happened since Ruskin's day, the virtual surrender of society to the power of profit. For one thing, the word is unhistorical, and it is itself the product of a response to nature that we have around us now. It's a reaction against it, of course, but the assumption that there are, on the one side, human beings, and on the other, their environment, is implicit in the word environmentalist. And Ruskin would not have wanted to go along with that. He was the product of quite different intellectual and spiritual traditions. Notably, that part of the Christian tradition whereby the world is understood as having been made for our benefit and delight, and at the same time, the intensely inward and emotional response to nature we associate with the generation before him in literature and art, the so-called Romantic Movement. In particular, one would want to name the figures of Turner, the painter he so adored, and the poet William Wordsworth. I want particularly, though, to think not so much about Romanticism as about the Christian tradition that Ruskin inherits. And I want us just to look briefly at a psalm, Psalm 95, which in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer is always sung at the service of morning prayer or matins, and includes these words, as I've only given you a short section from the psalm, which Ruskin often quotes part of. It goes like this. O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And it goes on. I want particularly to think about what, he said, what the psalmist says in verses 4 and 5. The image that it gives of God as a kind of artist somebody who constructed the earth with his bare hands. It's a kind of analogue which Ruskin makes with the human artist, the human craftsman. <coughs> I don't think Ruskin believed in a literal fundamentalist sense that God got down on his hands and knees and made sandcastles. It's not like that. It's rather that Ruskin thinks the only way one could talk about these things is in terms of the physical facts. He does not want to dream away the mythological power of that by abstraction. But Ruskin believed that you could interpret nature almost as you can interpret a book. And he belonged to a tradition of thinking about that. I quote, for instance, a writer of the 17th century, the writer and physician Thomas Brown, in one of his most famous books, he says, there are two books, there are two books from whence I collect my divinity. Besides that written one of God, which he means the Bible, another of his servant nature, that universal and public manuscript that lies expansed unto the eyes of all. Those that never saw him in the one have discovered him in the other. Now that, in a way, could be Ruskin. You had to read the Bible, but you also had to read nature. Nature was the other book. And of course, in Ruskin's own lifetime, it became more and more difficult to look at nature in that way because of the new developments in modern science, most obviously those associated with the name of Charles Darwin. Nevertheless, Ruskin fundamentally believed 
that the only way to respond to nature was what he called admiration. To abstract oneself from nature, to cut oneself off with it, from it, was to lose the fundamental meaning of it, its fundamental purpose for us. Um, we live in our relationship with the world around us. The power of the Bible for him was in its forthright myth-making. He came to it with a sense of awe and wonder at the face of nature. We are part of nature, he argues. But on the other, as he believed, nature is in some sense made for us and only has its full being in our appreciation of it. All great art, he wrote, is the expression of man's delight in God's work, not in his own. But observe, he is not himself his own work, he is precisely the most wonderful piece of God's workmanship extant. This sort of emphasis on the human has sometimes been associated by modern thinkers with the assumption that because nature was made for man, man is somehow free to exploit it and change it as he chooses. Many have blamed the situation in which we find ourselves environmentally on the Judeo-Christian tradition itself. But that is not how Ruskin interprets the Bible. He sees the privilege that God has conferred on us as entailing in us a reverence for nature. And with that reverence, a sort of responsibility, a responsibility for nature, what theologians call stewardship. We are the stewards of nature. Now that understanding of the relationship between God, nature and man seems to me to be most concretely shown in Ruskin's remarkable drawings. Ruskin, you know, was also, among the many other things he did, a great artist. And his drawings, watercolour paintings, reveal more about his view of nature than almost anything else he did. In the last book he wrote, Priterita, his autobiography, written in the 1880s when he was on the brink of insanity, he relates a moment in his youth when he discovered how the natural world should be represented. He focuses it, probably slightly fictionalizing the story, on one particular occasion when it came to him like a kind of epiphanic vision. He was 23 and just recovering from a bout of flu. Too weary to continue a short walk, he lay down wearily on the grass, only to be drawn out of his reverie by a tree on the bank opposite, a small aspen tree against the blue sky. And he says this, and I've only given you part of the quotation. Languidly but not idly, I began to draw it. And as I drew, the languor passed away. The beautiful lines insisted on being traced without weariness. More and more beautiful they became as each rose out of the rest and took its place in the air. With wonder increasing every instant, instant I saw that they composed themselves by finer laws than any known of men. Notice the inverted commas around composed, that's important. At last, the tree was there, and everything that I had thought before about trees, nowhere. The woods which I had only looked on as wilderness, fulfilled I then saw in their beauty, the same laws which guided the clouds, divided the light, and balance the wave. He hath made everything beautiful in his time, became for me thenceforward the interpretation of the bond between the human mind and all visible things. And I returned along the wood road, feeling that it had led me far. 
It's a very, very beautiful passage, and I must say I return to it again and again for wisdom. He seems to be saying that the purpose of art is to teach us to see the world we live in and thereby to come to know it and through knowing it begin to know God. If a work of art is beautiful it is so because the artist has learnt about beauty in the school of nature and that is the work of God. The composition, that word, of natural forms, we talk about composing a work of art but here we notice that the subject of the work of art composes itself. Composition of natural forms is infinitely more subtle and complex than anything that can be invented by the human imagination. <coughs> Artists learn to compose pictures by observing and seeking to follow the shapes that they find in the world around them not by imposing human conventions on things that shape themselves by finer laws than any known of men. The lesson Ruskin had learnt quickly becomes apparent in the wayward compositions of his own drawings and their rendering of detail. This is an illustration to Ruskin's great book, The Stones of Venice. And it shows you at the bottom of the plate, uh, the plate is in two panels in effect, the bottom panel is the entrance, uh, an entrance in the west front of the Cathedral of St Mark in Venice. Um, it's a bit difficult to see in the slide possibly, but you have the figure of a prophet sitting on a throne and decoration is a vine and the picture is called the vine free and in service. In the bottom picture the vine is in service serving the uses of the image. At the top you see an image of how the vine naturally grows and you see how as Ruskin understands it the medieval artists understanding of the vine is transferred into the structure of his image that the spandrel, which is what you call that shape in a doorway, is a shape which rather resembles the pattern in which the vine grows. And it's been slightly abstracted in order to fit into that shape. It's very important to see this, that Ruskin talks about the representation of nature as it is, but he also knows that that representation is limited and restricted and focused by the media in which we create things. So the shape of a door alters the fundamental structure of the vine while at the same time <coughs> referring to it. But let's look at some of the more pictures which are really there merely to observe what goes on in nature. This is quite an early drawing, 1847. Ruskin was in his 20s when he did it. Trees in a lane up in the Lake District where at the end of his life he was to live. It's hard to see in that image. I'll give you a slightly bigger image of it. Um, but one of the most striking things about it is you could see quite clearly that every leaf that is in the picture is individually painted. Ruskin understands that no two leaves are the same. His notion of beauty is in that variety. It's contrary to the idea of an earlier generation that beauty is an abstract ideal to which the artist tries to conform everything. No, says Ruskin, it's not anything abstract. It, the way things are is in all their variety. Just as we are all understandable as individuals, so every leaf is an individual. And it's in our individuality that we are of help to one another. And the leaves, he wants to argue, are also of help to one another. Cheap Darwinism will argue to you that everything is in a struggle. Everything is fighting against everything else. 
Ruskin says, no, that's not true. The differences of things enable them to collaborate. That's what a tree is. It's a collaboration between leaves and all the other things that make up a tree. There's another thing I want to say about this picture that's quite important. There's a kind of metaphorical element in it. The, we've just seen a picture of the entrance into a building. And this tree is also the big tree in the front, also creates a shape like the entry into a building. So there's a kind of analogy being, you'll see a better example of this in a minute, but there's a kind of analogy being made between the way things are in nature naturally and the way we make things when we are making useful constructions. For instance, let's take this other one. This is called uh, Aiguille de Chamonix, the peaks of Chamonix. The big one is Mont Blanc, the largest mountain in Europe. Uh, Ruskin was a great enthusiast for mountains, particularly the Alps. But that picture, in that picture, he's looking at the peak of Mont Blanc, a little as if it were the spire of a cathedral. And the mountain, the lower mountain in the front is like the roof of the cathedral. If you stand on the roof of one of the great French cathedrals, for instance, which you can do in a number of cases, and look towards the spire, this is roughly what it looks like. And in a famous sentence from the Stones of Venice, Ruskin refers to, and I quote, the look of mountain brotherhood between the cathedral and the Alp. It's also in that essay that he talks about the way cathedrals are built, and he understands that they're made up of the individual work of the different craftsmen, all collaborating together to make a fine thing for their whole society. It's out of that insight, incidentally, that the arts and crafts movement grew and continues to flourish in such a place as Los Angeles today. These are not, it should be said, in the strict sense, landscape drawings, not in the way that, for instance, Turner's paintings are landscape paintings. These are not populated landscapes. They're rather better described, I think, as nature studies, ways of looking at the things that are in nature, not so much at views. It's more what might be called and, well, to give you another example of what I mean, particularly in the 1870s when Ruskin was teaching, teaching at Oxford, he began to focus a great deal on particulars, on taking just one individual thing and looking at it and painting it. And this is perhaps the best known of them, a peacock feather. And you see the rather miraculous way in which Ruskin manages to depict the different textures and feelings of the different things that go up to make that feather. The down, for instance, that you can see on the quill as against the harsher feather that is the external covering of the bird. These sorts of things became Ruskin's forte in the 1870s. It's not that he was indifferent to context as his readings of Turner show. And there is also a range of his own pictures in which he does try to look at um, a human social context, a, um, the, structure, the, 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 the society behind the artefact, if you like, such as, for instance, this picture here, which is of farm buildings in Switzerland. Ruskin was very interested in the way of life in the mountainous regions of Switzerland. And he tries to depict it, I think, as a way of life to set against the life that he was criticizing at home. This picture shows us, I think, the variety of activity which uh, is necessary in an agricultural community. And also the way that way of life has grown not only out of nature itself, but out of the past of the society. So for instance, uh, on the left of the picture, you could see what appears to be uh, a section of ruined tower of some sort. And the wall along the front of the farm is clearly an older building to which the farm has become attached. So there's an understanding there 
of human community um, as being historical as well as social in the modern immediate sense. And I'm sorry, I'm missing a bit. Uh, yes, these drawings bring to mind the other dimension of Ruskin's conservationism, which I haven't time to talk very much about, but we'll give you some examples of. And that's to say his interest in the human built environment, which he felt was under challenge in his day. One of the great threats to the architectural heritage in the 19th century, it still is a great threat, but it was a greater one then, is the threat from what was called, incorrectly, restoration. Taking buildings that were in a state of structural decline and rebuilding them as if they were new buildings. And Ruskin wanted to argue that this is an impossibility and that far from saving our past by these means, we actively destroy it. And so I'll just give you a quotation from the book in which he most memorably discusses this issue, which is called The Seven Lamps of Architecture. Neither by the public, nor by those who have the care of public monuments, is the true meaning of the word restoration understood. It means the most total destruction which a building can suffer, a destruction out of which no remnants can be gathered, a destruction accompanied with false description of the thing destroyed. Do not let us deceive ourselves in this important matter. It is impossible, as impossible as to raise the dead, to restore anything that has ever been great or beautiful in architecture. That which I have above insisted upon as the life of the whole, that spirit which is given only by the hand and eye of the workman, can never be recalled. Another spirit may be given by another time, and it is then a new building. But the spirit of the dead workman cannot be summoned up and commanded to direct other hands and other thoughts. Ruskin went about observing buildings being destroyed in this way. One of them, what is arguably the most beautiful building in Venice, the Car d'Oro on the Grand Canal. He saw the stone actually being pulled out of the building and smashed before his eyes. And the building that you see today is not the original building, but a replica. Here we see a photograph, a daguerreotype, taken by Ruskin or one of Ruskin's servants, of the building at the time when it was being restored. And you can see how on the sea story it's being pulled apart. And for a long time we didn't realise that this drawing of Ruskin's of the Car d'Oro was representing exactly that. And the blank that you see in the picture was precisely the part of it that was in the process of being destroyed by inverted commas restoration. Ruskin was not going to tell lies in a painting and so he left a blank. That's what the Car d'Oro looks like today. I think it's pretty clear if you look at it in that context that it is an artificial replica. Sadly. So I haven't really time to go much further into that aspect of the subject of Ruskin and architecture, but you see how closely that is related to his feelings about everything. The feeling of reverence for material, for craftsmanship, for human bonds and loyalties is deeply connected in his writing to his sense of the bond between man and nature. As he puts it in that passage from Praeterita, between the human mind and all visible things. Sarah Atwood puts it like this. She says, Ruskin believed that good architecture, the physical expression of our dwelling on the earth, can only be produced in a culture that reverences and respects the natural world. Without right feeling for nature, architecture will be correspondingly bad 
brutal, poorly designed and poorly built. We don't have to go very far to see the truth of that statement in any of the great cities of the world, be it Los Angeles or London or wherever. It's hardly surprising that imbued with such reverence for nature and the things of the spirit, Ruskin should react with horror at the blight brought upon nature by industrial development and economic competition. His attack on laissez-faire economics, most notably in the little book called Unto This Last, is savage and to some of us unanswerable. There is a pair of sentences that occurs in both Unto This Last and the book he had just published before he wrote it, the last volume of Modern Painters, 1860. And the sentences are up there on the screen before you. Government and cooperation are in all things and eternally the laws of life. Anarchy and competition eternally and in all things the laws of death. He, be he was beginning by now to see the laws of death everywhere he looked. In 1809, sorry, start again, in 1869, a bit later than that, in 1869, he published a book of lectures about Greek mythology and religion, which he called the Queen of the Air. The Queen of the Air is the goddess, the Greek goddess of wisdom, Athena, uh, whose purity he associates with the element of air. And in the introduction to that book, he has this to say, and it's really the first sign, I think, that Ruskin is beginning to be so profoundly preoccupied with this issue that he's going to have to do something about it. This first day of May, 1869, he says, I am writing where my work was begun 35 years ago, within sight of the snows of the Alps. In that half of the permitted life of man, I have seen strange evil brought upon every scene that I best loved or tried to make beloved of others. Ah, masters of modern science, give me back my Athena out of your vials and seal, if it may be, Asmodeus therein. Asmodeus is the Hebrew demon of lust who is contrasted with the pure goddess Athena. You, and means the masters of science, you have divided the elements and united them, enslaved them upon the earth and discerned them in the stars. Teach us now but this of them, which is all that a man need know, that the air is given him for his life and the rain to his thirst and for his baptism, and the fire for warmth, and the sun for sight, and the earth for his meat, and his rest. In these sentences, you can see the origins, I think, of the body of which I am fortunate enough to have been given charge, the Guild of St. George. I'm just about to come to that. We may be amazed by the transformation of our planet, by modern scientific achievement. But what is the cost to it? And through it, to those elements we all need simply to be living things, the great elements of earth, air, water, and fire. By the 1880s, Ruskin had come to the conclusion that the world's whole climate was changing and doing so irrevocably. I'm not going to say, as some people have, that Ruskin exactly foresaw the situation in which we find ourselves now, in which we have to talk about climate change. But he did understand that climates do change and may change irrevocably. And he began to feel that this was happening. And he logged the changes in a diary that he kept, which he described different sorts of cloud that he was witnessing, 
different effects to the mountains of the Alps, different um, uh, manifestations of weather, what he calls a plague wind that seems to have been afflicting the Lake District where he lived. And in 1884, out of this material, he produced an extraordinary lecture, half neo-biblical prophecy, half modern social and economic criticism. He called it with memorable force, the storm cloud of the 19th century. Blanched grass, blighted grass, sorry, blanched sun, blighted grass, blinded man. This is the consequence of these changes. If in conclusion, you ask me for any conceivable cause or meaning of these things, I can tell you none according to your modern beliefs. But I can tell you what meaning it would have borne for the men of old time. Remember, for the last 20 years, England and all foreign nations, either tempting her or following her, have blasphemed the name of God deliberately and openly and have done iniquity by proclamation every man doing as much injustice to his brother as it is in his power to do. Of states in such moral gloom, every seer of old predicted the physical gloom, saying, the light shall be darkened in the heavens thereof, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. There is a picture of ice clouds over the mountain opposite Ruskin's window in the Lake District. Ruskin's plague cloud, as he calls it, and I'm quoting now, because I had, don't have this quote on your sheet, looks partly as if it were made of poisonous smoke. Very possibly it may be. There are at least 200 furnace chimneys in a square of two miles on every side of me. But mere smoke would not blow to and fro in that wild way. It looks more to me as if it were made of dead men's souls, such, as a, such, of, them as are not your, such of them as are not gone yet where they have to go, and maybe flitting hither and thither, doubting themselves of the fittest place for them. So that is Ruskin if I may use the term, the proto-environmentalist. As Jim was explaining to you in his introduction to this lecture, Ruskin's thought now turned to practical measures. Was there some way in which instead of preaching, one could do something? And he founded the Guild of St George. I have to say, you cannot really claim, even I cannot really claim, that the Guild of St George in Ruskin's lifetime was a great success. It was at this phase of his life that his mind was beginning to break. He was not naturally a good organiser and the organisation never really got the support it needed to be successful. But it did get enough support that it was able to focus uh, activity in a number of areas and to persist and it's now probably at its liveliest for something like a century and it very much rooted in what Ruskin established for it. The slide on your screen is um, the origin of that logo I showed you at the beginning. Um, it's a, this is Ruskin's copy of a great painting by Vittore Calpaccio <coughs> in Venice of St George and the Dragon. You see that it's, the scene is imagined by Ruskin is play, taking place on a field, sorry, not by Ruskin, by Carpaccio, but copied by Ruskin, on a desolate place, a place turned to desert in effect by the depredations of the dragon. And in the background you can see traces of a civilization which is gradually falling under the control of the dragon and this process of gradual death. And Ruskin saw this as an emblem of the situation in which he thought modern society had situated itself. <clears throat> uh, 
And I'm going to now take you just through a few of the things that the Guild does. First of all, a few quotations from Ford's Clavigera, where Ruskin talks about the purpose of the Guild. First of all, when he announces its foundation, he says, I have listened to many ingenious persons who say we are better off now than ever we were before. I do not know how well off we were before, but I know positively that many deserving persons have great difficulty in living in these improved circumstances. That kind of irony is very characteristic of Ruskin. But it is a phenomenon that we still see in the world around us and which was a crucial thing in Victorian England. The constant description of Victorian Britain as being the richest society the world had ever known. If, Ruskin wanted to say, if this is the richest society the world has ever known, how come there are so many poor people in it? I think we can find some places today of which that might be said, can we not? Mm -hmm. I won't name names. <laughs> well, Ruskin's response to that situation was, for my own part, I will put up with this state of things passively, not an hour longer. I will say again that I don't think the Guild was a great success, but my God, Ruskin put his money where his mouth was. He poured all his money into the Guild of St George, a great deal of his labour, and it's partly for that reason that the Guild has money today. The purpose of it initially was, and I quote, simply the purchase of land in healthy districts and the employment of labourers on the land under the carefulest supervision and with every proper means of mental instruction. This is the only way of permanently bettering the material condition of the poor. And then the promise that he makes, I vest my gifts in trustees, desiring them to apply the processes of the St George's Fund, the purchase of land in England and Scotland, which shall be cultivated to the utmost attainable fruitfulness and beauty, by the labour of man and beast thereon, such men and beasts receiving at the same time the best education attainable by the trustees for labouring creatures. I'm not sure what a horse's education was supposed to be, but Ruskin was going to give it to him. Sorry, I've not switched on to that next slide. The mountain home of the museum, he said. He set up a museum which still exists in Sheffield in the north of England. I'll be showing you a map in a minute, to give you some ideas of it. And he describes it as a mountain home. It's not mountains, actually, nothing like mountains, it's hills. But anyway, he liked to exaggerate. The mountain home of the museum was originally chosen not to keep the collection of art out of the smoke, but expressly to beguile the artisan out of it. Sorry, I, there's a misprint there. Um, one of the things that afflicted Ruskin was the sense that working people, which after all is the majority of the population, were denied the ability to see clear sky and breathe fresh air by the need to spend all their time working in the hell holes that industrial cities were. And that was part of the point of the museum in Sheffield. Or in terms of the land that the Guild bought for farming, or was given for farming, last quote, we will, try to say some, we will try to take some small piece of English ground, beautiful, peaceful, and fruitful. We will have no steam engines upon it and no railroads. We will have no untended or unthought of creatures on it, none wretched but the sick, none idle but the dead. That phrase, beautiful, peaceful and fruitful, has become a kind of motto for the Guild of St George, what we think that land should be. And the word fruitful, I think, is very important because, of course, fruitful does imply profitable. Ruskin's not saying you shouldn't make any money out of this, but he's saying you shouldn't make any money out of it illicitly. It's perfectly reasonable that you should want to live the map shows you the two main areas of guild activity today. There are several other areas, 
but we own significant properties in those two bits of England. Sheffield in the north, a in great industrial town, now I suppose a post-industrial town, but um, one of the most vigorous cities of the Industrial Revolution, where we have our art collection, and the Wire Forest, a little to the west of Birmingham, um, a very large area of ancient woodland, predominantly oak trees, of remarkable <laughs> beauty, where we own a large area of land. We own a section of the forest, two farms, several orchards. And I'm going to show you some pictures of life going on in Beaudley. Beaudley was, without question, the most successful part of the Guild's enterprise. Um, it attracted, in the late 19th, early 20th century, a large number of people to come from all over the country to build utopian communities there. Ruskin's idea was originally these communities should be served by the sorts of things that you find in great cities. So this was in the country, but there would be an art gallery and a library and a school and all things of that sort along with it. None of these things quite happened. But actually, we're trying now to bring some of them closer to happening. So that, this is one of the early guild communities, um, right at the beginning of the 20th century. And there are similar communities of people in the same area now. And here <coughs> excuse me, is one of our two farms, St George's Farm. which is to be the object of our biggest new enterprise. We wish to build a little community around this farm where there will be artisans workshops, a sawmill, an orchard, um, a study centre, um, all the things indeed which you need for a civilised community. These are all pictures, first of all, the black and white ones of the farm as it was circa 1900, shall we say. This is one of the orchards. They grew cherries there. Today it's predominantly apples, actually. Cherries are much more problematic to grow because they get eaten by the birds and therefore they need much more tending and you need to employ much more <coughs> labour, which we can't actually afford to do. So we do apples instead, which are much easier to do. And Worcestershire produces what are probably the best apples in the world, actually. Interestingly, my colleague John Isles, who you'll be seeing in a picture of in a minute, produces what I think is one of the most interesting examples of what's wrong with our economic system today. Worcestershire, where this farm is, produces over a hundred species of apples which are famously tasty. You go into the nearest supermarket to this farm, and where do the apples come from? Peru. <laughs> <laughs> they don't buy apples from their own community. And the apples from Peru are no good because Peru is not a place that's good for growing apples. England doesn't produce many good fruits, actually, but it does produce good apples. <laughs> but we don't sell them because we're not interested in doing that. This is an efficient economic system I'm talking about. You do know that, don't you? Yeah. This is the other farm, Uncle's Farm, which is where my colleague John lives. John Isles is our director of properties in the Guild, and he's our tenant farmer at the smaller of the two farms, Uncle's, which you see from the air in about 1950. And here's John and his wife uh, outside the building. Um, and here's one of the cherry orchards. It, this one actually still does grow cherries. And John has very kindly for me set out um, some of the objectives of the Guild as he understands them in the wire forest. To seek to live as Ruskin suggested, but in today's context. To respect the natural world, provide meaningful work, produce quality food, encourage creative creativity and reflection, develop people's skills and abilities in a small rural community. Not too much to ask, you might think, but hard enough to find in most places. Sustainability, using electricity mostly from the sun, mostly heat from wood fuel, grow around vegetables and fruit, low input organic farming, 
therapy through work. Incidentally, that's, we'll see a picture of this in a minute. They do a lot of work at Unkley's in the therapeutic line, bringing people from cities who are suffering from mental illness or from drug addiction or from alcoholism um, or from uh, problems of psychological health generally, bringing them to the farm several days a week to work on the farm and restore their faith and happiness in life. Um, and I've seen it in practice and extremely successful. Practical achievements at Unclis, the restoration of traditional orchards, which by the middle of the century had been regarded as worthless because you make money some other way. You don't make money from things like fruit, which are only food that people eat, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And restoring hay meadows, that's to say sustainable um, and meadows in which wild flowers grow. Um, it's a very interesting fact I hadn't realised myself, perhaps some of you do know, I know some of you study the environment. John explained to me that the, um, the, the wild flowers that grow naturally in grass, if you don't use pesticides and so on on the grass, uh, have properties which protect the animals that eat the grass against the diseases that they're likely to get. So if you don't pour pesticide all over the field, you actually provide sustenance for the rest of your operation. It's in that sense, of course, that this is profitable or fruitful, to use that word. Um, just a few pictures of what it looks like. It's so pretty there, and I love going there. These are wild anemones, wood anemones, in the spring, growing in one of the fields I'm talking about. <coughs> Um, here are deer in the woods coming towards the human environment, fallow deer, uh, which roam freely through the forest. Herd size is kept down to 250 uh, through an annual cull because uh, trouble, there's a problem with deer that they have no predators in England and so you have to keep the numbers down otherwise they become a pest. Um, Dexter cattle, which are used on, the, which are um, kept on the fields, they're um, for production of meat. This is a care farming team. Care farming is a movement in Britain which we're part of, which I, such as I was describing to you, where you bring people who have social or psychological problems to work in the country for the restoration of their well-being. And there's a group of such people collecting apples picking and sorting apples. Um, those are going to be used for juicing. One of the things we do is produce juice for profit. We sell Uncle's Farm juice. Pigs and chickens we keep. Um, this again is to do with uh, the care forming principle. These people are young people from cities who are blind and they can't, they've never actually seen, because they're blind they can't see, animals before, but they come into the country and they feel the animals and they get to know them through touching them. And so you see there this young man feeling a chicken. There's a look of intense pleasure on his face. Charcoal burning. One of the ancient crafts are pursued um, and they do charcoal burning and <coughs> sell charcoal. Uh, and pretty impressive it is too if you ever, I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, it's a quite powerful thing to watch. On the right of that picture you can see my predecessor, one of the great Ruskin scholars of modern times, Jim Dearden, when he was master of the Guild of St George. We've recently built a bar, a, a, a new building out at Beaudley on the farm which is called the Ruskin Studio. And this is used for office work, meetings and things like that, but also for educational work. And this is really going to be the foundation of our, the cultural element which we're hoping to build in Beaudley. Here you see um, the art museum which Ruskin was hoping to build. That's a drawing by an artist called Joseph Southall, whom he commissioned to do it. It looks rather quaint, I always think. It's sort of Italianate. Um, art museum. Never happened, alas. But perhaps something like it will happen in the near future. Uh, this is the Ruskin studio. These are the original drawings from it, for it. 
That's the building going up. It's a wood frame building, traditional English building. Uh, not in any sense, incidentally, uh, retrospective, nostalgic, simply using traditional methods, but combining them with necessary, when necessary with modern things. For instance, as you see there, um, we have um, roof panels, so solar panels on the roof. All the heating is from the sun. Same time, we don't look down on old crafts and we try to learn and practice them. So there are women in the studio doing spinning, learning how to spin. People, um, students who come in to study in the, in the, uh, on the farm, all those students in those, that picture have just learned how to make chairs. Each one is holding his or her own first chair. <laughs> In our art gallery in Sheffield, we're currently running a project, which Jim mentioned, Ruskin in Sheffield. Um, and one of the communal, some of the work that's being produced there is communal. And this is a tree made out of um, bits, cut, well, it, uh, slices from a, beech, a birch tree from in the wire forest. Uh, each slice, uh, an individual person has put a picture on it. So I might distribute them to you in this room and you would draw the thing that you most love in the world on that picture. And then you make up a tree out of the bits. Tree of life. Dis birch discs is what they're called. Yeah, that's right. And lastly, this is what the forest looks like. Uh, healthy, untouched by those things which would do harm to it. Thank you very much for your attention. Gabriel, do you want me to do questions or something? Yes. Or yes. Would, would anyone like to ask me any questions? Well, I'll ask one. Yeah. As a member of the guild, yeah. that I don't really know the answer to, how do you fund all these projects? Well, different ways, of course. The guild is, because of Ruskin and his contemporaries, the guild is relatively well endowed. So we have quite a lot of uh, income. The farming, project, uh, the farming enterprise provides quite a lot of income. Uh, we also own houses which are rented. So there are different sources of income. The main sources of, of income is undoubtedly the money that Ruskin put in in the first place. Um, but we also, uh, we also apply for funding. So we get funds from different funding bodies as well. Um, yeah. So we're not rich, but we, you know, at a time when a lot of people haven't got any money, we have a constant, predictable income which we can use, and it's well managed. Ron. Yeah, Clive, I might ask this of Jim as well. Are there any contemporary writers that are sustaining the Ruskin vision that you would recommend? Me. <laughs> and I presume Jim as well. And, and Fred. Fred. Yeah. Yeah. Would, for instance, would Wendell Berry be part of this? Yes, I, well? I and I were talking about him the other day, and yeah. he said, well, who in America? And I thought immediately of Wendell Berry. Yeah. I don't know whether Wendell Berry knows Ruskin, but he thinks like Ruskin and, yeah. and is interested in the world in a deep, humane, <coughs> and caring way like Ruskin. Yeah. And in human beings as well. It's not just the world. I thought the point about linking human beings to the world as elements of the world is yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, you can't always tell, I mean, it's such a case of Wendell Berry, you can't actually tell whether he's got it from Ruskin or he just happens to think like that. There's a, a new writer in Italy um, who I heard speak recently in Venice and have been reading his books called Salvatore Settis, who's a retired art historian who has launched this blistering attack on the Italian government's administration of the arts in Italy and has a kind of vision for the future of Italy, which is quite exceptional. And he reminds me of Ruskin. Sorry, did somebody? Could you spell Setis? Yes, I will. S-E-T-T-I-S. -T -T uh, unfortunately, he's not translated into English yet. He, there is, you can get, 
I'm sorry, I can't remember the title of the book. It's a very complicated book. But there is one chapter, the last chapter, of one of his books you can get on the internet in English. And it's a, it's a very crucial and important chapter. But I very strongly recommend it. He seems to me the great <coughs> man at the moment. As a Ruskinite, can I, can I recommend a writer who is not contemporary, but perhaps is the most significant writer in the Catholic tradition of the 20th century, who is the teacher of the last two popes, which is Romano Guardini. And I would recommend his letters from Lake Como, written in the 1920s, as being absolutely prophetic. Are, are they influenced by Ruskin, or are you just saying they're like Ruskin? No, I would say this is a kindred spirit. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he knew Ruskin, yeah. uh, Ruskin's writings. Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much for coming to the rough and tumble West and recognizing the resonances that exist here between Ruskin and, and what we are uh, doing in California. Thank um, you. Uh, it, early on in your talk, you, um, you put up a, on the screen uh, a quote from modern painters. Um, all great art is the expression of man's delight in God's work, not in his own. Yeah. And I was struck by uh, the um, of uh, the, the subtle distinction between that quote and what William Morris or Charles Robert Ashby might have said, uh, almost the same thing, but without the word God. Yes. Uh, and, and, they're, and thereby really contradicting yeah. uh, Ruskin. Uh, yeah. Can you comment on that or make, make an observation about that? Yes, it's funny you should say that because I was thinking about that kind of thing as I gave the lecture. I was trying to think, I'm saying an awful lot about God in this lecture. And I'm sure there are a lot of people in my audience who would not share Ruskin's view of God. And it's, I suppose you'd be true to say, Jim, wouldn't it, this is something we discuss quite a lot. Is it, is it necessary to share Ruskin's religion uh, in or, to agree with him, as it were? Um, I happen to share his religion, but that's another matter. I, I, I think it's not necessary. And I think Ashby and Morris are good examples of it. What Morris and Ashby have is reverence for the things they work with. And that's really all Ruskin's saying, I think, is that we should have reverence for what we are given. You don't, it's not necessarily given to us by a person or by God or however you understand it. It's we should be thankful for being alive and to respond with gratitude to what there is. Why should we affront what we have been lucky to have been given? Uh, so you don't really need to talk about God. I mean, some of us are then led to think, well, can we explain this giving? And perhaps God is an explanation. But I don't think it's a necessary explanation, no. I think that's a terrific question, by the way. It's something which preoccupies me and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues a great deal. Yeah. I just wanted to add in this, in this context your, your quote that you used from the Queen of the Air, which is really lovely. Yeah. At the very end, um, with this idea of reverence where, where Ruskin writes, the air is given to him, us, for his life, and the rain for his thirst, and for his baptism, and the fire for warmth, and the sun for sight, and the earth for his meat, and yeah. his rest. And you can put God in there, or you don't have to put God yeah. in there. But all those things are true, Yeah. right? Yeah, that, that's really what I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, I was thinking about it, how appropriate it is that we, you gave this speech in the um, in a room de dedicated to polymaths, and <laughs> so I was just wondering if Ruskin had any was influenced by that fellow over there, Goethe. Uh, it's terrific. I was thinking, well, what a terrifically appropriate thing it is for me to be giving. It. I should have said that, in fact, because the first thing I thought when I came in, yeah, I think Ruskin was affected by Goethe. He didn't actually read German. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to read Goethe if you don't know German. He's not, he doesn't translate well. Um, so I think Rusk, I, th I don't know, perhaps somebody else can help me with this, but I think Ruskin was aware of Goethe's greatness and refers to it occasionally. But I don't think he knew Goethe very well. But I mean, there is an obvious comparison between them, isn't there? He's, well, I've been wondering whether he did read yeah. German. Um, I'm giving a talk uh, next week in uh, San Francisco. Um, I shall be staying with Gray in San Francisco, in fact, in Berkeley, um, uh, with a colleague of mine called Angus Gordon, who runs a thing called Ruskin Mill Trust, which is a body which um, 
seeks to use craftsmanship and work, physical labor, to bring um, education and well-being to people who have psychological adjustment problems, particularly autistic people. Um, and he is very much influenced by Rudolf Steiner. But he said, uh, he very often begins his talks by saying, I've been affected by four people. Goethe, Rudolf Steiner, Ruskin, and Morris. Those are his big stars. And he thinks that you can create a kind of composite of those four figures. So, yeah. You spoke of Ruskin's transition from writing to doing. Yes. Uh, what do you, to, nowadays, what do you think is being done? What do I think? Is being done, like to a, a not support environmentalism, because we spoke about not using that word, but support Ruskin's beliefs. Do you mean, what do I think Ruskinians, <coughs> Ruskin's followers are doing? Doing, yes. Well, uh, yeah, we are, I mean, certainly the, those of us in the Guild of St. George are trying to get back to some of these primary ideas that he was talking about, but trying to do it uh, in a way that recognizes that we live in a different world to his world. So it's, Ruskin is very specific about things, but I think it's possible to understand his ideas in a different context. Um, so what I was trying to talk about in telling you what's going on at Budley uh, is our attempt to do that. Now, we're only a small company. We've got only 160-odd members. Um, but we're try and we, we try to encourage um, the arts and crafts when they involve serious craftsmanship, serious respect for materials, all that kind of thing. Um, we engage in socially responsible projects. Um, and I don't think we're the only people who are doing things like this. I think there are plenty of people who are not Ruskinians who are doing things like this. And we think that's very good. I mean, we, I, another thing I'm interested in doing is trying to make connections with people who are doing the things that we believe in for different reasons, perhaps, or out of a different, you know, tradition. But, so I don't feel I've answered your question very effectively, but it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just thinking about uh, climate change and the whole environmental movement, you know, I, I thought of myself as familiar with it, but Ruskin seems like such an innovator in his time yeah. of talking about this. Why do you think that maybe he doesn't get as much play in conversation about in being the innovator who said, you know, or the person who was saying, this is happening, you need yeah. to pay attention? Well, it's a, it's a hard question. I think Ruskin, first of all, Ruskin, Ruskin's reputation went through a very serious decline. I mean, Ruskin, when he died, was probably the most famous intellectual, British intellectual in the world. And uh, the reaction that set in against the great figures of Victorian England uh, probably affected him worse than any of the others, because there was something about his manner which was very unfashionable in the modern age. Um, and he's very, very slowly been clawing his way back, as it were. It started in the mid-1960s. It got a great leap in 2000 when the centenary of his death occurred. And it now, he now seems to be on the way back. There's also a problem about publishing his books. It, I mean, I've worked, you know, I've published one of his books. But I mean, it's very difficult to persuade a publisher to publish a very large intellectual book by a writer of the 19th century. They just do not believe they're going to sell. And so one of the real problems about Ruskin, there's a huge amount being said about him, but nobody publishes his books. So you, you, know, you can't go out to a bookstore and get modern painters, just not there. Um, so this is a problem. I, I, hope, I don't know if that's the only answer. I suppose the other answer is, well, this gentleman's question about God I think that the religious language that Ruskin uses is for many people a bit of a block. Um, my own view is there's a kind of logic to it that you, it, you don't have to believe literally in Christianity, but I can't see how you can believe in reverence without some sense that there's something on the other side of the reverence. But we, we're being told that we shouldn't think that by a number of people. Jim? 
Well, I just wanted to add to, I mean, in my, my sense of, of Ruskin's great decline in popularity is that when he was alive, he was like a force. He was like a tidal wave. And, and nobody could ignore him. He wrote so brilliantly and argued so per persuasively that people just couldn't write him off. But after he was gone, they could. And, they did, and I think the bottom line is they didn't like what he, what he was saying. They didn't, he was a moralist all his life. He, he was never afraid to say, this is good for human beings, and this is bad for human beings. So human beings who are thinking about things should do these things and not do those things. And as the 19th century turned into the 20th century, we were becoming an ever more relativistic society. We didn't want to hear people telling us what's good for you and what's bad for you. It's, uh, you know, chacon na so good, to each his own, everybody choose. But Ruskin would say it's never that. It always is something. This, this harms people and this helps people. If you're a responsible human being, go with the things that help people and not in the other direction. And I think that's one of the reasons why he was so quickly shunned, because he was a moralist. I'm, oh, sorry. Ron first, and then this gentleman. Yeah. I just wanted to add something. I'm, I'm also part of the Ruskin uh, group as well, and, and you can correct me on this slide. Yeah. Uh, there were at, at the end of the 19th century in England, in the beginning of the 20th century, there were a number of other very similar movements led by people like Chesterton and, and distributism, including utopian back to move, uh, back to nature movements. They did not fail, please correct me if I'm wrong, they did not fail because they were utopian. They were killed by the First World War. Mm -hmm. The First World War destroyed idealism, uh, That's not just true. in England, but across Europe. Yeah. From 1914 on, all of these ideals went down. They were not unsuccessful. Yeah. Under, under, under. Actually, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I'm, sorry, I know you want to say this. I'm just thinking about Gray's. Gray gave a lecture to us last year in Sheffield about Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and you argue that through the settlement movement, they were interested in Ruskin, I think you're right. And it's certainly true also that the political forces that reshaped Britain in the 1940s, for instance, were also profoundly influenced by Ruskin. Um, I, these, are, these are things it's a bit difficult to explain to Americans because there's so much stuff I would have to explain first. But both Britain and America were actually governed by people affected by Ruskin in the 1930s and 40s. But nobody noticed that, that because, because what were they doing? They were governing the country. Who cared what they'd been reading? You know. So I think it was around and then there's been a further reaction against all that in contemporary politics, that the welfare state notions, New Deal notions that we associate with Roosevelt and Attlee and so on, are no longer in vogue. And uh, they're regarded, somehow, you know, helping one's brothers is regarded as a sort of an oppression on the individual. I'm, I'm afraid it beats me, but <laughs> I think that's a very helpful thing to say here. Well, I do, I do think that uh, that, that, um, that, uh, that is all uh, uh, true, and that there are at the same time ways to bridge uh, Ruskin's vision with, with today's uh, relativism. Um, and, and I think that's been going on uh, throughout the last century. People like uh, John Muir and uh, Joseph Worcester in San Francisco yeah. um, uh, we're naturally attracted to, to Ruskinian thought. And uh, those of us who follow the arts and crafts movement yeah. uh, um, understand that, that s some of the things, it, it's like a smorgasbord. Some of the things have to be uh, left aside, for example, focus on God, uh, for it to seem, uh, for, the, for the ideas to seem relevant in the 21st century. Uh, and, and, and so I, I, I wouldn't despair, in other words, yeah. about uh, the, the uh, um, uh, the value of Ruskinian thought in the 21st century yeah. simply because he had more of a focus on God than we are yeah. comfortable with today. Yeah. Uh, that there, there are ways to look at that. I mean, John Muir uh, uh, found his church in the mountains, yeah. uh, much as Ruskin focused on, uh, yeah. on, uh, on nature. And yeah. so that's a comfortable place for people to go to feel close, closer to Ruskin. Yeah. Um, and that might be something you comment on at the Sweden Origin Church next week. San Francisco. <laughs> All right. You're going to be there. I hope to. Oh, great. Excellent. That'd be wonderful. Okay.
I realize I have to stop. Is that right? Right. right. <laughs> uh, do you one more question? Yeah. It's very quick. Um, yeah. For anybody who's interested in this, um, I really recommend uh, the, the secretary of, of the guild is a man named Stuart Eagles, and he wrote a, a marvelous book called um, After Ruska. And it's about not only the people who were knowingly affected by Ruskin, but those who were sort of indirectly affected by his ideas um, and may not even know of Ruskin. And it's a hard to get book, but I'm sure this library has that book, After Ruskin. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I can endorse that. It's a terrific book. Me too. And Stuart, incidentally, is the editor of the magazine, mm -hmm. which is over there and which, as Jim mentioned, is $10 a go. <laughs> <laughs> but have a look anyway, even if you don't want to spend the money. Gabriel. Yeah. Well, thank you so much.